Hi, everybody. This is Blaine DeSantis, and I welcome you back to another episode of Books and Looks, my weekly podcast of books, interviews, and something I'm looking at. And you know what? I'm on vacation. Yeah, even even book readers and podcasters get to go on vacation. But I have recorded this just for you. That's right. I'm recording this introduction for you because I wanted to talk to you about a book we're going to be in an episode we're going to be giving you today. It's an older episode, but in case you've missed it, I think it's one you want to listen to. It's an important one because, as you know, I love horses and horse racing. And this past week, there have been two or three more deaths up at the Saratoga Racetrack on the course. As a matter of fact, one with a horse that was going to win the race was one stride away and broke down. Uh, terrible, terrible situation. It was called Maple Leaf Mel. And anyway, I thought it would be good to go back and take a look and a listen to the book Broken by Fred M. Cray. Now, Fred is a lawyer. Uh, he's written a wonderful book, and I think you're going to really, really enjoy this because it's it's a, about not a, a, a tragedy in the sense that it was an accident. It's a tragedy because something or somebody killed this horse, this a prodigious horse, Aladar, considered one of the top 30 horses of all time. It was in a stud farm in Kentucky, and the next thing you know, one night, mysteriously, it dies. And how did this happen? And Fred Cray has done a wonderful, wonderful job of uh, trying to put together a timeline and what was really going on there at that place. And we're going to let you try to make up your mind. He does that. Yeah, he lets you make up your mind. Who do you think killed Aladar? It's a wonderful book. And if you haven't had a chance to listen to that episode, we've got it for you right now. That's right, right now. And not only that, the book is spectacular. Get, get the book. I don't care if you get it through viewsonbooks.com or if you go to your library. I don't know how many libraries are going to have the, the book about horse racing, okay? Especially down here in South Carolina where it's not even legal to bet on horses. Ah, drives me nuts. But anyway, so I, I welcome you to listen to this episode of The Book Broken. That's a little bit different than our most recent episodes. Okay, because it's one of our older ones, so the format is a little bit different. But nonetheless, it's an important book. It's a relevant book, and I think you're really, really, really enjoy this episode and this interview I had with Fred Cray. Now, I'll be back again next week, and next week you have a brand new one from me. So don't give up. I'm coming to you next week with a brand new episode. So until that time, this is Blaine DeSantis for ViewsOnBooks.com and for Books and Looks, saying may all your leaves be pages in a book. Hi, everybody. This is Blaine DeSantis, and I welcome you to another edition of Books and Looks. That's right, my weekly podcast when I tell you what I'm uh, reading and what I am looking at during the week. You never know. Always something different. And uh, I want to ask you if you could please uh, share this with friends, with relatives, with fellow readers. Uh, today, I just checked the statistics, and apparently... We're becoming rather big in the Republic of Serbia. Never knew that, but apparently the Serbs are now listening to the show. Thank you for coming on. Thank you. Please, please uh, share it with your fellow Serbs or whoever. We appreciate it very much. You know, um, one thing I'm tired about when I when I listen to podcasts, I don't know if you listen to other podcasts, I do, is that three-minute introduction, okay? That three-minute introduction with sales pitches, and other shows being brought to you by this person or that person, and blah, 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 blah. You're not going to get that here, folks. No no sales pitches, no long-winded introductions. It's just going to be me saying, hey, we're talking about books, we're talking about looks, and let's have a great time because we have another really good interview for you today. Now, the book that I'm going to be reviewing today is one that came out in December of 2022, and it's by a good friend of mine named Richard Martin. The book is called Oranges for Magellan. Oranges for Magellan by Richard Martin. It's a 360-page book. It's put out by Regal House Publishing. Now, I listed this as one of my top 15 reads for 2022. But I never really got into the whole thing with you here. And so I thought I'd go back now that it's been out a few months and uh, go into why I feel this is such a great book. You know... This is a wonderful and, I say, a quirky uh, novel that Mr. Barton has written. 
And it's all about a guy by the name of Joe Magellan. Now, Joe Magellan has an obsession. He has to climb things. That's right. Joe Magellan needs to climb things. And he keeps trying to climb things, be it orange groves or be it flagpoles or whatever. And this is something that after a while, he has to go to an anti-obsession group. That's right. This this uh, be, this book begins with him going to an anti-obsession group to get over this desire to climb flagpoles. Well, he, quote, graduates, end quote, and two days later, he's ready to start up again, okay? He realizes that the whole anti-obsession thing is just a racket and uh, that he wants to get back into the whole bit, and he's going to start climbing another flagpole. Now, why does he want to <laughs> climb flagpoles? I, you know, I'm really not sure why he wants to do this, but he has one goal in mind. Maybe not something you and I would want to do, but, you know, in Richard Martin's mind, Joe Magellan has this goal. He wants to break the world's flagpole sitting record. That's right, sitting on a flagpole, the record he had, he has to go actually 444 days in order to do this on top of a flagpole. Yeah. So this is the story in which his story about a continued obsession that, that uh, Joe Magellan has to break this record. So how does he go about doing this? He just, just doesn't go to the top of a pole and sit on a little knob at the top. No, no, no. What he does is he he's comes to this rundown restaurant and he buys it because his wife is a great cook so he buys this and right next to the uh, restaurant is a big flagpole and there it goes up and he has a couple of vietnamese people who are going to build him a big platform up there 10 by 10 hey uh, this is not it's not luxurious but it's 10 by 10 and up he's going to go to break the world flagpole record now this is this is a strange thing because Joe Magellan's got a wife. He's got a son in junior high, or now I guess they call it middle school. And he's going to forsake all of those to go sit on top of the the flagpole. He communicates them. Basically, uh, he has a telephone installed so he can call down to his wife in the in the uh, the restaurant. He can talk to his son there too. And if there's anybody passing on the street, eventually he realizes walkie talkies are a great means of communication because he's way up there. I mean, he's He's not 10 feet up in the air. He's like 40, 50 feet up in the air, you know. And so he can't really hear what they're saying, but he runs into a lot of people. You know, he has a, one of my favorite characters is a transvestite movie theater owner who becomes a good friend of his. And uh, we, his gets exploits in the whole thing. You know, there's 100 chapters in length, and every one chapter is devoted to another little segment of time or his situation. And, you know, we have this uh, movie theater owner, the school principal where his son goes to school, but eventually becomes a, becomes a big supporter of his. As a matter of fact, wishes he could climb up with him because he's sick and tired of the school systems. <laughs> we have got reporters who are making their uh, reputation covering him. We've got the uh, the news helicopters flying by. We've got other reporters who are trying to tear down his uh, reputation, enhance their reputation as you know contrarians we've got people who are sponsoring him and this and that and the next thing and through you know again luckily it's california so it's not the harshest of all weather but you know he has a he can get a little umbrella up there he can sleep he has food brought up to him you know in a little basket he gets food and he watches a little bit of tv on a portable tv and uh, you know it's a hundred you know, a hundred feet or whatever it is up there. He's 444 days. And this is his attempt. And we see how it affects him, how it affects his wife and his son. You know, everybody's affected in a different manner. But when I read this, I said, my God, this is just such a different novel because I get tired. I don't know about you folks, but I get tired of the same old, same old. Okay. I know I love mystery books, okay? But we know there's mystery books. We know somebody's going to die or something's going to happen, okay? And also I get tired of the same old types of historical fiction that's out there, okay? A lot of the same stuff again and again and again. Get tired of it. But this is a topic that I've never heard covered before, and Richard Martin has done a wonderful job with it. 
If you get a chance, really go out and you want to buy this, I don't know if it's going to be in your local library. You can go onto my website. You can uh, click the link in that book review and you can go right and get it from Amazon. I get 25 cents, by the way, from that. And uh, if you do that, I think you're going to enjoy. It's called Oranges for Magellan by Joe Martin. And as I promised you, we have an interview. That's correct. We have got an interview today, a really fascinating individual, a fellow lawyer. name is Fred M. Cray, and Fred's going to be here to talk about his newest book. It's entitled Broken, and it's a story, it's a sad story about the mysterious death of the horse Aladar. Now, Aladar may be the most famous second-place finisher in the Kentucky Derby or Triple Crown history, but well-known horse, true story, mysterious sudden death, and I think you're going to really enjoy what uh, Fred's got to say about this very, very mysterious topic, which happened back in 1990. So without further ado, let's go to our interview. Fred, welcome aboard. I got a chance to get this book. Uh, I was intrigued, and I'm telling you what, it is a wonderfully written book about the life and career and unfortunate death of this horse. And uh, before we get into the book, though, could you give us a little bit of background? Uh, what what type of education, what type of writing career, what, what, what have you done? Well, as you said in the introduction of, I'm a lawyer. I never really had, I wish I did, any uh, writing classes or journalism classes when I was in college. Uh, I went to the Pennsylvania State University in uh, University Park. And then, strangely enough, I went to the University of Nebraska for law school. And then I became a trial lawyer for 25 years in uh, Miami. And after I sort of burned myself out of trial law, which is, for me, was not a really good fit for my personality, I, by happenstance, got into uh, the practice of animal law. It's a funny story. I was at home and I got a, a ticket for having my dog not registered. And I had to go to trial over that. So, you know, I went down to the court. So I went in front of the, you know, the uh, animal control guy and he said, Hey, you know, you owe money. Your dog wasn't registered. And I pulled out my dog's ashes and I said, listen, uh, my dog died well before this, uh, this, this fine was given to me. And I, the judge looked at me and he said to the guy, he's got you there. And the whole courtroom erupted in laughter. And the guy was so mad, the county, the animal, animal control guy, that he said, Oh, we're going to appeal. And, you know, he whipped the, he said, I'm going to take a, a copy of these ashes, you know, and he took it off to the copy room. I said to the judge, look, you know, I'm a trial lawyer. There's nothing here to, to appeal. Why? Why are we doing this and wasting the taxpayer's money? And he said to me, and this is what changed my practice of law and animal law. He said to me, he's just mad because he lost. <laughs> and, you know, yeah. I went home that day and I thought to myself, you know, what kind of way is that? to uh, run animal control, you know? Uh, and there were so many people there that didn't know anything. They didn't know how to represent themselves. And so I started doing that. And I found it to be very satisfying. And I will tell you that, you know, I've, I've handled some very big civil cases, but reuniting a dog with its owner, you know, after it's been wrongfully uh, accused of doing whatever is the best feeling. And I had more fun doing that than I had in the 25, 20 years that I practiced civil I don't, trial I law. can understand that. Now, when you see you do animal rights law, is this all down in Florida, or do you go across the country doing this? Well, it's first of all, I want to say that it's really animal welfare law. You know, um, animal rights has a pretty PETA sort of, you it's know, true. really, you know, to the, a really extreme view of, of, of animals. Um, I uh, became a lecturer on the subject. I taught law school for a year. And in 2016, I was awarded the ABA's Award for Excellence in Animal Law. So, you know, I've written some articles, not journalistic, but legal articles about uh, defending dangerous dogs. You know, your dog gets out and kills a cat. Uh, and now they want to put it to sleep. And, you know, I'm the guy that comes in and tries to get your dog off 
death row. And uh, is that all in Florida? Or do you go, again, because of your national reputation, do you go across the country if people want you? Well, I've been, I've been in many different jurisdictions. I would say uh, one of the things that I was big in was defending pit bulls who had been identified by, let's say, the fire chief as a pit bull and banned from the county. So I was big into that. I had a case in uh, California. No, no, I'm sorry, Washington, the state of Washington, and also one in Louisiana. And I found it to be super interesting because you get to deal with uh, the dog genome, uh, you know, how many, what percent of genes from dogs uh, are the same and whether or not there's a gene for dog fighting and whether you can predict what a dog looks like and wow. compare it with what the breed is. So oh, that's fascinating. fascinating. Oh, yeah, yeah, it really is something. Well, well, good. I'm glad you Are you still doing that? No, I sort of, when I started writing this book four years ago, it took all my time. I know you're going to ask me this. How did I get involved in this book? Eventually we will, yeah. So we'll hold that for your ne- for when it's appropriate. Well, let me ask this question. When did you uh, sort of get involved and in, in, get an interest in horse racing? Well, it's interesting. I, I grew up in Atlantic City, and there's a track there. Uh, the Atlantic City Racetrack, which has since long been closed. I went there one time, and I found $200 on the ground. And my friend said, hey, you bet on the floor, and it came in. <laughs> I didn't really know anything about horse racing. But when I went to law school, uh, I worked at the track, the Nebraska, the Lincoln, Nebraska track for uh, three years. And uh, I was working at the paramutual window. But I got to see the horses run. Uh, I got to see the the backside of horse racing, which is the hot walkers, the grooms, and uh, all the people in the, that, that do everything that you don't see in the three minutes that the horses race. And I just fell in love with them. There's something about the quiet wisdom of a horse, the size of it, the beauty, that's different than any other animal. And I would say I developed a respect for horses because when you look at the history of them, you know, they dragged us out of the Middle Ages or, you know, the Bronze Age. And they were the beasts of burden that, you know, helped us farm and uh, bring in the agricultural revolution. And I feel strongly that they deserve our highest stewardship in horse racing and in every every other way they're used. I tell you, I, it, you didn't have to go to a big track to develop a, a love of the horses. I mean, I grew up in Pennsylvania, and uh, while I did uh, my fair share of horse tracking out in California at law school, uh, I, you know, my, my native track was uh, Penn National, you know, which is in Grantsville, Pennsylvania, a little, little place where and we like to joke that the horses plowed the North 40 in the day and ran at nighttime. It's not the best, but they're it's out there. It's a whole different running. level of horse racing. Oh, unbelievable. Although, you know, it's funny. I, just the other day, I'm, my son was telling me that uh, the Pennsylvania horse uh, won a, I think, uh, won a one of those Kentucky Derby qualifying races out in California. And you're seeing more horses from tracks that are not traditionally big horse uh, triple crown tracks doing very very well horse racing has changed greatly since alador yes yes it has absolutely well that's now did you follow alador back when uh, he was racing or did this interest no, in the I horse follow uh, you did actually that's when i fell in love with him was you know i was practicing law in miami and it, it's, it's one of those jobs that's it's you can always do something else and you're always working and one day I decided to take the day off and, you know, I had been, you know, I, I liked horse races. So I went down to, uh, uh, Hialeah Park, which has been closed now. And, uh, I went to the Flamingo Stakes back in March of 78 and saw him race in that race. And I fell in love with him at that time. I don't think it's easy to explain to someone how you can be one of 20,000 in the stands watching a horse race and just fall in love with that horse. I mean, he came down the stretch and he just went on fire. And, you know, you could see, hear the sound of his nostril, you know, breathing, going, and his hoofs beating and the determination. I just, I just loved him uh, so much so that he ran next in Miami at the Gulfstream Park, which is up in Broward or Hallandale Beach. And I saw him there in the Florida Derby. And again, he was just dominant. You know, he, uh, 
the, when they were in the stretch, you could see the the uh, his uh, jockey, Phil Velasquez, just tap him twice, you know, on his neck, and he just took off. And I fell in love with him there, and then I had to say that my job just overwhelmed me after that, and I, I didn't follow horse racing then at all until I left Miami after I retired and moved to Gainesville. Uh, and then I was able to, you know, have time to explore my other interests. And I actually went down to Gainesville, is right next to Ocala. And uh, that is the second horse racing capital of the world, Ocala. I mean, they breed horses, actually affirmed, who was Aladar's rival, was born and bred in Ocala, but owned by uh, Wilson, who was a, a uh, corporate raider. But in any case, I went down there to uh, take a horse farm tour. And while I was there, I was talking to the lady who was running the tour, and I said, uh, you know, she asked me these questions that you're asking me. And she said, well, what was your favorite racehorse? And I said, Aladar. And uh, she said, well, you know, there's a lady who's driving the van who was on the farm when Aladar was hurt. And I said, oh, I'd really like to talk to her. So I went to talk to her, and uh, I call her Miss Calumet in the book. And I said, you know, I'd really like to talk to you. And she said, well, I'm not going to talk to you. I said, why not? And she said, because I'm afraid for my life and my children's life. And this shocked me. Right. That catches you right in the beginning. You know, very good. Well, let's talk a little bit about, let's talk a little bit about the book. Give us a brief description and, and, and the, what I think is a really great style that you use to get everything out to us in this book. Well, you know, you're asking me a question. I'm glad you asked me because I agonized over how to put this book together for a year. Uh, and I'm glad that you found that the, the organization was great because I'm trying to write a book that's sort of, you don't know the ending until the end. You know, it's like a trial you go through and you may have some ideas about the evidence, but, you know, so it's, it has to be that the accident or the injury to Aladar happens first because that's what grips the reader. And so then you have to figure out, well, how does the audience care about Aladar? So the second part of the book has to briefly go over his career and what he meant to Calumet Farm and how he carried Calumet Farm financially uh, with his breeding uh, money for years. Um, so that was the second chapter. And the third chapter is after Aladar was injured and he was uh, euthanized in November of 1990. After that, Next came an FBI and federal investigation into what happened. So that's the third part of the book. And then the fourth part of the book is me saying, look, I see what happened in the insurance investigation that happened in part one of the book. I see what the FBI did. I went and got the trial transcripts from Houston where the trial took place. Let me go and interview witnesses who maybe didn't say everything that they could have in the trial and maybe never testified in the trial, and find out what additional information they had. And truthfully, I wasn't sure I was going to write a book, because it's very, it was very intimidating to me to think, when I got to the part where I was going to do my own investigation, that I would come up with anything new or interesting that hadn't already been covered. And when I got about halfway through my investigation, I thought, you know what? This is interesting. I think people would like to read it. And there are some things that I found out that weren't known and never known by anyone that that would shed light on, you know, the incident that happened on November 13th, 1990, mm -hmm. when Aladar broke his leg. Man, that, then that's what it's all about. Aladar breaks his leg in his uh, stall. And uh, after an unsuccessful attempt to surgically repair it, breaks uh, another leg, uh, another bone, and then is euthanized. What was that two days after the initial uh, injury? Yep. So he was injured the 13th and was euthanized the, the 15th. And, you know, when I first got into this case and looked at it, I was able to get the pictures that were taken by the insurance adjuster the night of the incident. When you look at all the pictures and you and you use common sense, you don't see how a horse could have done broken his cannon bone, which takes 7,000 pounds of pressure, without leaving anything on the stall door. 
There's no mark. There's no gouge. There's nothing on the, you know, the theory of him getting his foot caught be between the stall door and the wall. That wall is painted, you know, his racing colors, devil's red. There's not a mark on there. That was the first, my first impression was, where is the force shown anywhere? And that's what, how I, I mean, I, that's how I felt through the whole thing. And it hasn't changed. When I interviewed the doctor about this, I said, well, you know, Dr. Bramlage, I said, did you look at his glove to see if he had any hair, or wood, or, you know, cement? No, I never looked at that. So. And, then, and you go, this is the interesting part. I mean, the, the horse uh, was a huge moneymaker for uh, Calumet Farms. I mean, this was what the... Uh, like the, 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 I don't know if they have a sire of the year, but this horse they won do. in a lot of money. They do. Okay. In 1990, the day, the, the year of his death, he was the top sire for 1990. Uh, he's had, uh, he was one of the most successful breeding horses. I mean, at one point, his breeding fee was $250,000 per, you know, time. And it didn't matter if the, if the mare got pregnant or not, you were just paying for that. And the trouble they got into at Calumet was they sold his breeding seasons in advance. So before 1990, they had sold millions of dollars of his breeding seasons in, let's say, five or six years before. And take, took the money in. Let's say you would pay me a million dollars and you could breed Aladar every year, once, once, a, once a year. And so they did that all in advance. And the year that Aladar was injured... They weren't making enough money coming in because they had sold those breeding seasons in advance, and so they ran out of money. Well, that's uh, and that's one of the that's one of the big issues you're going to see in this book about uh, uh, they didn't have enough money and they were running out of uh, time with their insurance. Uh, I think the one the, the, had, did they get a notice that they had like two months or two weeks to get something paid? If I'm not mistaken, yeah, they had they had two insurance policies. One which was Lloyd's of London, and one one was with Golden Eagle. And um, Golden Eagle had written them a letter saying, look, you're not paying the premiums. We're not going to chase you down for it. Uh, we want to cancel your policy. We're not going to renew it. And so that was a that was a five million dollar policy. So there was some pressure to do this before that lapsed. And I think to me, the most telling thing about on the side of whether this was an accident or I mean, I mean, there are some people that will read this book and some people have the opinion that this was an accident. I'm, I'm, the book won't persuade them, I don't think. But my thing is this. If it wasn't an accident and it was clearly, you know, if it was an accident, clearly there was no question about that. and Everybody was purely innocent. Why did they ask the groom that was... Uh, on the, the, the actually the night watchman. Why was the night watchman asked to take a week before Aladar was killed? Asked to take Tuesday night off, and then Tuesday night was the night he was injured. And secondly, if this was an accident, why did Calumet Farm not let the insurance adjuster in before the door was fixed the next day? And thirdly. Why isn't it, if it's, if it wasn't an accident, why isn't JT Lundy and, you know, the Calumet management talking about what happened? None of those guys have ever said anything. No, not him, extremely quiet. Not Janice Hines, not, um, not Susan McGee. Uh, and they've never said anything. I never understood why they, they let Dixon in, the first insurance adjuster for Lloyd's of London. He was late, but they didn't want to let the second gentleman in. I still don't know why they didn't want to let him in. Uh, that next morning, I, I don't know why. Well, I think that, I think the reason is is that that more so Tom Dixon comes out the night of, and it's interesting. He wasn't supposed to be the guy that came out. It was supposed to be Terry McVeigh, but Terry McVeigh didn't answer his phone, so Tom Dixon goes out. Tom Dixon takes a few pictures. He takes the stall door on the outside and inside, but that morning at nine o'clock, Susan McKee tells the. The guy from Calumet, I want that door fixed today. So what happened to the door was there were bolts there that were broken when Aladar kicked the door, but we don't really know that because the bolts were 
rusted out. But they wanted this bulls fixed. That morning, Stanley Brown's just a guy. He comes in. You want me to fix him? I'll fix him. He doesn't save them. He, he doesn't check. I mean, they just reinstall the old one and throw away the bolts. The reason that I believe that they didn't let Terry McVeigh in was they wanted that fixed before he got in. And indeed, it was fixed before he got in. So when he gets there, and I interviewed him for the book, he says, hey, I couldn't even tell there a horse had ever been in there. The hay was fixed. The uh, the bolts were fixed. I saw nothing, no paint chips, nothing on the stall door. I just couldn't believe it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and that's what a lot of people don't understand is once uh, once a horse uh, is insured and they die, a lot of times the investigation is taken over by the insurance company. So Lloyd's of London, who had, what, 25 or $30 million involved? $36.5 million. They, they say, okay, we want to send our people in to investigate, and they're the ones who make the decision to euthanize or not. That's right, and Tom Dixon has nothing to do. You know, I've interviewed Tom Dixon, and Tom Dixon just gave them information. You know, he didn't say, hey, I think you should pay this, or he just said, here, here's what I've got. Now, he didn't do the greatest investigation, but this was a horse that was the sire. You know, Calumet was the was a big farm. I don't really think he thought, you know, he knew J.T. Lundy. He had, he had done work for him before, so. But the point is that um, what's astounding about this is that within 30 days, Lloyds of London paid their $36.5 million. And, uh, you know, now, Later on, you got an interview with someone, I don't forget the gentleman's name, who said there was never a problem. They, all, they figured out losses already in advance. They don't want to rock the boat. Yes, that was Terry McVeigh. Terry McVeigh uh, was the other adjuster. And he told a lot of inside information about the horse insurance business. And, you know, um, it's unfortunate, but, you know, anytime you have an industry where horses are valued, let's say Aladar for $36.5 million, and people think they can get that money, there is an incentive for a horse that's overvalued for that horse to be killed. And it is not, and you know, something that never happens. There was a, a guy called the Sandman. His name is Tommy Burns. And he killed 15 horses for owners who in the equestrian business, these owners would pay him like $5,000 and he would go and electrocute their horses. And it, it has happened. There's a whole law review article that lists all the horses and the ways they, way they've been, the way they have been killed. And it's very disturbing. Oh, it's gruesome. We'll get into that. It's, it's gruesome. gruesome. It's horrible and that it's people would do money. this. And, you know, Tommy Burns told me, you know, he actually helped convict these people who had paid him that the people would write him checks, you know, or five, and, and so when it came time for the FBI to say, hey, uh, what's this check for? They were kind of convicted already. A couple trials came through. The one that, again, you talk about wasting taxpayers' money. I kept thinking that's all that the Alton Stone trial ended up doing. It Alton Stone well, was I the agree, replacement I really, room. Yeah, I really feel sorry for Alton. It changed his life. Um. He was a guy in the wrong place at the wrong time. If you look at the newspaper reports, you know, everybody thought that, uh, you know, he was involved somehow. But what happened was the prosecutors thought that he must have known something. Either he was there when it happened or he was paid. And so they arrested him for lying to the grand jury. And I think if you read the transcripts, there's no question he lied to the grand jury. He made up different stories. Uh, one of the things that I found interesting was, you know, everybody wondered, why did he lie? Well, I interviewed one of his friends who talked to him that morning when he came back and asked him, you know, what happened? And he said, well, I went off the premises to eat. You're not supposed to do that. That's what really happened in my mind. He went off the premises. He came back. Aladar was injured. He thought, oh, my God, I'm going to lose my job. I went off the premises to eat. And so I started making up stories. But to your point, they thought he would talk, and he didn't have anything to say. So, you know, once you indict, you, you indict a guy for lying to the grand jury, are you just going to, you know, the prosecution's put in a spot where they think something happened, and now 
it comes time for trial and they have nothing. So they went through with it and uh, it was not a great result for the prosecution. I mean, he got a, a nothing sentence. I talked to him uh, briefly. He's still mad after 35 years, didn't want to say anything about it. And it is where I said, hey, you know, I'd like to talk to you. And he said, look, I want to tell your story. And I, I hope if I talk to him when I go to Lexington in a couple of weeks again, I'll say, look, you know, my book exonerates you, really. Maybe you'll talk to me, but I could feel the pain in his voice when he said, i have done already told my story and I'm not talking again. And I, I can I can understand that. But uh, this is a gentleman who was a replacement night watchman and... Uh, Again, uh, it's, a, it's fascinating because they cut back the security around a month or two before. Then the regular night watchman is told to take a day off. And here comes this guy. I kept thinking of Lee Harvey Oswald saying, I'm a patsy. I'm a patsy, which is exactly what we have here. You know? Yeah. So, you uh, think, you know, that you think the ironic thing is that the, that the stallion bar where this happened had $50 million worth of horses in it. Uh, Secreto and Capote, these other horses. Uh, Al Calumet had paid fifty million between thirty and fifty million for those two other horses, so Aladar was insured for thirty six. That's eighty six million dollars, and you're leaving them alone for an hour, while the 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 night watchman goes and checks all the other barns. So, you know, today you'd have cameras, you'd have you know, this wouldn't happen. Right, that's right. But this wouldn't happen was, today. Yep. No, and Calumet ran out of money. They ran. They were so short of money that they could not pay a guy to sit in that in the stallion barn all night. So it's it's a you know, it's it's all down to money. Yeah. I read a book one time, I think it was called The Fall of the House of Mondavi about the winery and how the family all went downhill. And I could think of this thing, it's like you could recall this the the, the fall of the house of Calumet because the barn is what down to money. Bad management, mismanagement, just bad people running things and taking advantage of these poor horses, you know? And, well, uh, what you really have to understand about Calumet's, what happened, is that J.T. Lundy, who who was the person who ran the farm, the reason he was running it was because four of the heirs to, to the farm didn't know anything about horse racing, so they let him run it. And they gave him carte blanche. And the sad thing is, is not only did J.T. Lundy run Calumet into the ground, but he, re- he wasted all the heirs' money also because he went to them and said, look, I want you to sign personal loan guarantees. They didn't know what they were signing, they say, uh, and they ended up owing money to him. And there were decades of lawsuits after between the heirs and the bank and the trustees and the bankruptcy court. It was just a mess. I'm telling you, it is, it is a fascinating read. So let me get you. You uh, you believe this was an intentional act that was done where they broke this horse's uh, cannon bone, which is the right rear leg. OK, but we have no idea who may have been the one involved in doing it, do we? We don't. We don't. We, we don't know the person who did it. Uh, we know that what we know is that, boiling it down is that I don't think J.T. Lundy ordered this. Because J.T. Lundy only got the farm, only got a million dollars out of the all this insurance payment. And who got the money was First City National Bank of Houston. They were the lost payee on Aladar because they had loaned Calumet $50, $40 million. In order to get that loan, they, they collateralized Aladar several times. And so when he died, First City got twenty. Twenty and a half million dollars, I think, directly. Didn't even go to Calumet; it went directly to First City. So, who was the? If you if you follow the money, the only entity that made money off of this horse's death was First City. They were owed forty million, and they got paid half of their money on November. You know, in, in November of nineteen ninety, if they hadn't got paid then. Six months later, Calumet declares bankruptcy, and they owe $180 million. If if First City had to get in line with those other creditors, they may have gotten, you know, cents on the dollar. So it was in their best interest. And if you look at the relationship between the bank and Calumet, and this, I mean, if you read the book, you'll say, oh, my God, I can't believe how many deals they made that were so bad. But 
Frank Chiak, who was the guy who was the guy at the bank, was the was an indispensable guy to Calumet because he made sure when they got loaned this forty million dollars that no auditors looked at their loan documents, that they, they you know, they never followed through on their due diligence. He was their inside man that they had to do favors for to keep him their inside man at the bank so these loans wouldn't be investigated. And so in my mind, this is a no, I mean, even if you don't agree to that, there's no question it was intentional based on the lack of evidence and the night watchman being told to take the night off. And that was testified to in court under oath and um, the cover up that happened afterward. The fact that they fixed the bolt before, you know, before they could, could take pictures of it, threw, threw them away. You know, how does a farm, you, know, you ask anybody who was involved in this. Hey, do you think that you think they should have fixed this bolt the very next morning at, you know, at nine o'clock, uh, knowing that there was a thirty six and a half million dollar claim that was pending? And the answer would be no. Well, there this is a fascinating, uh, fascinating book. I was sitting there for one of the things I, I want to tell everybody is if you if you don't know a lot about Aladar and you want to uh, read the book and when he lists all the races that Aladar was in. You can go to YouTube and watch those races, uh, you know, as if they were happening today. It's a wonderful way to go back and forth and see this worse in action. The other thing right, is, if all, it, it's it's all on my website. So if you, oh, it's so all there. You, yeah, I mean, if you go on my website, uh, you if there's a race on YouTube, you just click a button and you can see it. There you go. You can see Aladar's trophies, even if you want to. And I wrote I wrote this book and made this website as a tribute to Aladar. Because, as I said at the beginning, I feel that this horse was unlucky in some ways. He gave everything in the Triple Crown races. And, um, frankly, I don't think he was as good a horse as Affirmed. Affirmed could run from the front. He could run from the rear. He could maneuver in between. Aladar had the stretch run, and that was it. So, but he never gave up. No, never. And so, never. I'm hoping that th that people who... This really is not a horse racing book. This is really sort of a true crime drama with horse racing, you know, being the setting. That's right. I was going to say that. you, If you were saying, saying where am I going to find it? Well, it could be under history. It could be under sports. It could be better under true crime. This fits all the genres. And it's uh, Fred, you did a wonderful job here. I really uh, appreciate what you've done. I don't want to keep you any longer. I know uh, you, we both have things we got to run to and do. I know you're keeping up with that trial we have down here in South Carolina, the yes, Murdoch <laughs> trial. So I'm, you know, I, I don't know if you're going to be writing a book on that, but uh, a lot of people are following that one very closely. So uh, not me. Well, I the, the thing about a trial is everybody has an opinion, but nobody knows what the jury's going to actually do. There you go. <laughs> very good. There you go, friends. It's Fred M. Cray. His book is Broken. It's about the mysterious death of the wonderful racehorse Aladar. Thanks so much for being with us today, Fred. And thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. Take care now. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, I hope you enjoyed Fred Cray and his book, Broken. It will be coming out in the very near future, and I think you're going to really enjoy it. It's going to be one of those uh, books that, I, you know, I don't know where you, you categorize it. As I said in the interview, is it a mystery? Is it a history? Is it a sports book? Is it a true crime book? It hits all the genres, and it's a fascinating story. And what I like, as I said, and we talked about it, you can watch the races either on his website or you can do it on YouTube. You can watch each race and you can see this horse in action. Great, great book. Thanks so much, Fred, for a great job. And hey, thanks to the uh, Greenville Podcast Company. They are just growing by leaps and bounds. I mean, they got two more, two more, yep, two more interviews for a new podcast coming up this week. So I tell you, the Greenville Podcast Company, they are doing a great job. They they produce our stuff here, and they, boy, I'll tell you, I can't do it without them. And also, hey, let's don't forget my website, viewsonbooks.com, where you'll see some of these books that I've reviewed. You'll see a lot of the books I don't talk about here also on that site. I have some interviews. As a matter of fact, coming up, <laughs> I have an interview. I well, already have a written interview with a gentleman by the name of uh, William Maz, M-A-Z, and uh, he's written another book, and I think we're going to be having him on in the very near future for actually a uh, an audio interview. So that, that's a first for us, but, you know, look, going everywhere to find the best and most interesting authors which we can find 
And again, this is our year of discovery, finding the authors in the books that not everybody's going to be talking about, but which are real books for real readers. And now we come to the second half. Well, though not the second half, the second part of the show, which is the looks part. Now, what have I been looking at? Okay, maybe you'll say it's a slow week. Now, I don't know. I'm seeing patterns. Do you see patterns? I see patterns in things. So three things that have been just this week just coming to my eyes. I sit here in my kitchen, okay, and we've got two big, these conical bird feeders outside, okay? And the birds, they're exactly the same bird feeder, except one bird feeder has a little shelter, a little, you know, I don't know what that would be, a topping on it that squirrels can't get onto it. The other one didn't. And, you know, for a year or more, I noticed that the birds have been going to that one with a little topping on it, okay? They eat that much more than they eat the one on the right side that had no topping, all right? I said to my wife, I said, I wonder what happens. Can we get a tame sort of shelter protection topping for this other one? So she goes to our local bird store. She gets the topping, puts it on. And now in the past few weeks since we've done that, the birds don't eat out of the one on the left anymore. No, they want the one on the right. Now, it's the exact same bird feeder they didn't want to eat out before, but now they like the one on the right with the topping. And I don't know, why is that? I mean, the squirrels can't get to either of them. You would think if they liked the one on the left, they would take the one on the left. Nope. As a matter of fact, as I'm recording this, there are five birds on on the one on the right and two on the one on the left. I, I don't get it, but it's a pattern I keep seeing. The other thing I keep seeing, uh, t- do you use Bing? Okay, my, my kids go nuts. They don't want to do, do a Google search, Dad. No, not that doesn't do a Google search. I'll do a Bing search because I get points from Bing. Do you get points? I get points from Bing. You do their little quizzes. You take their tests. You get points. And after so much, you can like, take so many points, and you can get some uh, coupons from Amazon, which I love, okay? So I do that. And uh, so I take these quizzes every day, every day. And they're, you know, there's like, what's going on? You know, do you know this thing about this topic? And every day there's a this or that. What do you prefer, this or that? Okay. And I have been watching this really intensely now for the past month. And if you have two choices, the choice on the top always wins. That's right. It always wins. And it's not just by a small margin. It's by a big margin. Okay. Now, I don't know about you, but the question of the day was, do you like, if you had your choice for breakfast, would you have pancakes in the top, waffles on the bottom? I put down waffles. I like, I'm a waffle guy, okay? 73% choose pancakes. It's on the top, okay? If it comes to a musical song by a performer, top one always wins. If it comes to an actor, top one always wins. Why is that? I wish they would reverse them. Now, for instance, put pancakes on the bottom and waffles at the top. Would waffles then dominate? I don't know. Do they have a preconceived idea? I don't know, but this is a pattern. I tell you, it's been a long week, folks, okay? <laughs> I'm looking at my bird feeder out here. That baffles me. I'm looking at the Bing questions. That's even more baffling that the top always wins. And then it comes to my wife's cooking, okay? Now, my wife is a great cook, all right? And she's gotten into baking in the last year, year and a half. Makes wonderful bread. I mean, she loves to make homemade bread. No bread makers, folks. Uh Uh-huh. We've got the whisk and we're whisking and doing and kneading and uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But I got her these these clay pots in which to break, uh, which to break, (laughs) in which to uh, make her bread. Okay. And so she puts this bread in the clay pot and she, she bakes it. And every time it comes out, the one side of the bread always slopes down. It's like a hill going down off the end. The other side, nice and high, just like you would expect it to be. Everything uniform height, except the one time on the left side, always, not just the one time. It's every time off to the or slope going down the ski slopes there. Why is that? I don't know why. I don't know. Again, we even put them in sideways, thinking, well, maybe it's the heat in the back of the oven versus the heat in the front, and maybe that's why it's sloping. When we put it in, you know, uh, side or diagonally, we go across it, you know, where we're vertically. No, this one side still 
always slopes down to the you know down to the ground. The left side always slopes. Why is that? I don't know, but it's another pattern, and it's driving me nuts. That's right. Oh, do you have things? Do you look at patterns? You know, a lot of people look out. A lot of people see conspiracy theories. I see patterns, folks. I'm seeing patterns out here, and you know what? It's just good fun. But things I've noticed during the week, like I said, things I'm looking at this week, it's patterns, folks. It's my birds. It's the bread. It's the Bing quizzes. Oh, boy, oh, boy. And I'll tell you what. I'm going to keep you posted to see if we've been able to find out if there's ever anything, a change in these patterns. If it would be, it will be earth-shaking, and I will let you know. <laughs> so anyway, folks, that's it for another week here on Books and Looks. I hope you've enjoyed it. You know, another great interview. we got another one coming up next week. Next week, oh, my God, we're going to have a four-time Pulitzer Prize-winning author on. Yeah. You talk about the heavyweights. We got a great interview coming out next week with you for you. I mean, it's going to be a wonderful interview. You're going to really love that. And, uh, you know, we're really trying to bring you great interviews, great books, and something I might be watching. Maybe it's a uh, TV show. Maybe it's my back window. Oh, I got a really good TV show that I'm in the middle of right now. I want to make sure it finishes as good as it started so I can tell you all about it maybe next week. So this is Blaine DeSantis saying, may all your leaves be pages of a book.